Good evening, folks. My name is Jason. We're here from Appalachia Crime Ministries from a couple different churches. And uh, if there's anything we can pray for you guys for, we'd love to pray for you. If you guys need a Bible, we have free Bibles. We don't want your name. We don't want your money. Just come take a Bible. But I want to share, take a minute, just a few minutes, and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Because I can tell you that we all need the gospel, myself included. I might need it more than anybody up here. But you know why we need the gospel? Because there's a statistic. And that statistic is this. Guess what? Guess what we all have in common? Guess what we all have in common? All of us have in common is every one of us are going to die. Did you know that? Would you agree with me that every one of us are going to die one day? So the, so the question is, what's going to happen to you when you take your last breath? See, that's the question we all have to deal with. It doesn't matter if we're here in Clarksburg, if we're in, in, in Michigan or Texas or California. It doesn't matter. If you're some far off country. It doesn't matter uh, what your social status is. What matters is every one of us is going to die. And so tonight I want you to think about, think about if when you lay your head down tonight, if you would die in your sleep, and I hope you don't, I hope you live a long life, but if you were to die tonight, what would happen to you two seconds after you take your last breath? After you take your last breath, what's going to happen when you die? That's what I want you to think about tonight, and I'm going to explain the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know there's many, many different uh, types of churches and gospels you'll hear around here, but the Jesus I'm going to speak of is, is not the Jesus of the Mormon faith or the Jehovah Witnesses or anything crazy like that. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's the God of the Bible. Jesus of the Bible is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and He is the end. He came as a sinless, spotless Lamb of God born of a virgin and he will return as the lion of the tribe of Judah and he will judge the living and the dead and friends this is a good news message understand that me or my friends none of us are here to condemn you none of us are here to judge you the Bible says if you don't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ you're condemned already and we don't want that for you we want you to have an opportunity of eternal life in heaven and eternal life with God the Father, the King of King and Lord of Lords. And so I just want to read a quick passage to you from John chapter 3. In John chapter 3 it says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, that means teacher, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered, and this is what Jesus said, and this is what I want you to think about tonight. This is not my words, these are Jesus' words. Jesus says, to you, uh, He say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now get that in your mind tonight. Remember that. If you remember one thing tonight that I tell you is this. Jesus says, if you're not born again, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Okay? And he goes on and he tells Nicodemus about that. So, to be born again, you may have heard that, that statement in a church. To be born again means to be born of the Spirit, okay? Uh, a new heart, and, and, and to be born again. And so, what are the evidences that you are a Christian? Because we talked to many people out here on the streets, and I asked them, I said, are you a Christian? Well, yes, I'm a Christian. Well, why are you a Christian? What makes you a Christian? And usually the first answer I get is, well, I believe in God. How many of you guys believe in God? How many of you guys believe in Jesus, right? Okay. Well, listen, let, let me say this to, to get you thinking a little bit. The devil believes in Jesus, and it's not helping him, is it? In James 2.19, the Bible says, even the, demons believe, even the demons believe in Jesus, and they shudder. They shake when they hear his name. So just saying, I'm going to heaven just because I believe in Jesus is not enough. That, 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 that's a good thing, but don't rest everything in that. It's not that you just... Uh, believe in Jesus and that's going to be your free pass. The Bible says, as we just heard in John chapter 3, Jesus tells Nicodemus, if you are not born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. So, so some, some people say, well, I'm a Christian because I, I prayed a prayer, or I asked Jesus into my heart, or I go to church, or I did this, or I did that. Listen, friends, none of that, none of that, none of that will get you into heaven. To be born again means that you have a new heart, 
which is evidenced by new desires. And to be born again, let me, I'm going to give you six things that you can think about. If you consider yourself a Christian, you believe in God, I want to give you six tests tonight for yourself. These are my tests. This is what Scripture says. And all I'm doing is sharing this message. And, and the first one is, there's not habitual sinning. In 1 John 3, 9, the Bible says, whoever is born of God does not commit sin. Now that doesn't mean Christians aren't sinners. Every one of us are sinners. Romans chapter 3 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What that means is that yes, we will fall into sin. Sadly, Christians do sin. However, when a Christian sins, a Christian that has, remember the word is born again. When a Christian has been born again, a born again believer in Jesus Christ, though he or she may sin, you will not be able to stay in that sin comfortably. When you do sin, there'll be a conviction in your heart. There'll be a burden in your spirit. There'll be a sadness in your, in your, in your attitude because you realize you have sinned against a holy and righteous God. And regardless what person you've sinned against, if you stole something or you hurt somebody or you committed adultery or abortion or homosexuality, it doesn't matter. That sin is ultimately against God. David tells us in Psalm 51.5, he says, For against you alone, God, I have sinned. So you're ultimately sinning against God. Okay, And when you have a new heart and you've been born again, the evidence of that is that you cannot stay and commit that sin and, 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 and hab habitual sin. Now, if you run into some of the religious people that tell you that they're, they're a Christian and they don't sin anymore, you can be like the Apostle John and you can tell them they're a liar. Because in John, or 1 John 1, 8, it says, if he says there's no sin in him, then you're a liar. So, so yes, we all do sin. And none of us over here are any better than any of you. Okay? So a new heart, a regenerate, a born-again heart cannot stay in that sin. It cannot stay in that sin. And he can't, you can't prevent the bad thoughts from your mind. You can't prevent sometimes falling in and giving into those thoughts and doing those things. However, when you do, there will be a sadness. There will be a burden. It may be instantly. You may be in sin for a short season, but you will not be able to stay in that sin. Because you will have a new heart. That's what it means to be born again. That you will have a new heart. And the second test I want you to think about is believing in Christ. Now everybody just told me they believe in God. And like I told you, the devil believes in God and is not doing him any good. So to believe in God, you know, what's that mean? In 1 John 5, 1, it says, Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. That, that, that a man, if you're born again, that, that, that Jesus is a Savior, and that you're trusting in Jesus for your, for, your, for, your, uh, for, for your eternity. You're not trusting in your good works. You're not trusting in your feelings. You're not trusting in your heart. And I hear that a lot. Well, God knows my heart. I hear that all the time. God knows my heart. Listen, friend, if you think God knowing your heart is a good thing, you're in a very dangerous position tonight. And we would love you enough to tell you that truth. Because the very thing you're trusting in is the thing that will condemn you and damn you when you stand before God in judgment. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says, The heart is so deceitfully wicked that no one could know it. So our hearts are wicked. Our hearts are deceitful. So don't trust your heart is why that you're considering and trusting your eternity. That, that, that because, well, God knows my heart. So that you believe in Christ, that you believe in Christ, and you do not fear, none of us want to die, but you don't fear that death because you know Christ is who He says He is, and He did what He said He did, that the Bible says He did, that He died on that cross and made a way taking your sin and my sin, paying your debt and my debt, because we don't have it in our bank account to pay for that sin, because we've sinned against the holy and righteous God. Let me give you an example of why our sin is so bad against God, what makes it so bad. Let me, let me give you a little example here. Let's say that, let's say that when I go home tonight, I, I tell my seven-year-old a lie, okay? What's going to happen to me if I tell my son a lie? Probably nothing, right? If I go home and tell my wife a lie, I'm probably going to end up sleeping on the couch for a few days. It's not going to be very good for me, right? So you're smiling. So what happens if I go to work tomorrow morning and I tell my boss a lie? I'm probably going to get fired. Okay, so what happens if I go, to the, go down the road and I get caught doing something and I tell a police officer a lie? I'm probably going to get arrested. Now, what was the difference in every one of those things? I did the same thing. I lied to everybody, but what was the difference? 
The difference is who I did it against and their standing, their position, their authority, and who they were. Now think for a moment, the God of the universe, the God that created the heavens and the earth and everything that you see, all the sky and the trees and everything around, the God that created that, who is perfect, who is holy, who is righteous, who is just, that's who we have sinned against, friends. That's who we've sinned against. We have sinned against an infinite, eternal God who is outside of time and space. And we don't have it as a finite man and woman who will die one day. We don't have the ability to make way for our sin. And so you believe in Jesus who He says He is. You believe in that Jesus did. That's the second mark of, of someone that's been born again, that you, that you believe. And the third test I want you to think about and compare your life to, these are things to compare your life to. Not my judgment. These are things that Scripture says to you. So you, you know yourself. The, the third one I want to bring your attention to is practicing righteousness. And here's where it's going to start to get uncomfortable for some of you, if you're really listening. Practicing and righteousness. And in 1 John 2.29, it says, Everyone that does righteousness is born of Him. Now, friends, this is the, the, the wonderful thing of the cross. Understand that we have sinned against a holy and righteous and perfect God. And because we have sinned against that God, we deserve what we deserve, every one of us out here, myself included, my friends included, we all deserve an eternity in hell. That's what we deserve. But it's not what we want for you because we care about you guys. How you doing, brother? Thank you. Hey, God bless you. But we, we, we want good, good stuff for you guys. We want your eternity or what we care about. And because we have sinned against that kind of a God, and that, that is our sin debt, hey, God we owe him. God bless you. We, we owe him, okay? And we can't pay that debt. We deserve God's wrath. We deserve hell. And, and that sounds harsh. That sounds judgmental. That sounds like not very nice things. That, that is something you don't hear from many churches around this area. But it's the truth that, that if God gives us what we deserve, don't ever ask God for what you deserve. Because if you ask God for what you deserve, it's not going to be very pleasant. Adam, there's books in my box. Yeah, get the ones with WV4G on them. So anyway, back to the story. So we have sinned against the holy and righteous God, okay? Now, here's, here's why... Here's why God just can't wipe it off and just say, okay, I forgive you, it's all good. Here's why. Let, let, let me give you an example. Let's say there's somebody who comes driving down the street in a car, and let's say he looks over at one of you, pulls out a gun, and shoots you, okay? We get his license plate number, we track him down, the cops arrest him. They arrest him and take him to jail. He goes to court and he stands before the judge. And the judge looks at the guy, we know he's guilty, he's a murderer. And the judge says, hey, I'm a forgiving, loving judge. You're free to go. Now, would that be fair? Would that be justice to just let that guy go because he's done some good things? That's what it's like when you try to earn your way to heaven. See, friends, let me show you how short we all fall. Let me show you God's standard. Listen, atheism is a lie. It is a lie from the pit of hell. Okay? And anybody that wants to claim atheism, come on over here and talk to me. I'll be happy to discuss that with you. But let me tell you what, the standard of good and bad are not my standard, it's God's standard. God defines what is good and what is bad. And God takes it up to a level that we cannot... The Bible says that the law, the Ten Commandments, the law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. That we have the Ten Commandments and we have the law to show us that we can, we're not good enough. And we need somebody else to help us desperately. Let me give you an example. How many out there have ever told a lie? Have you ever told a lie? What do we call people that, what do we call people that, 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 that tell lies? They're a liar, right? Have you ever stolen anything? I don't care how much the value. That right? And what do we call people who steal things? Thieves, unless you're in Pittsburgh and you call them stealers. We call them thieves. Hey, Jimmy, we call them, we, we call them thieves, right? Let me ask you, have you, ever, have you ever looked at somebody... Anybody out here, I know I'm guilty. I know I'm guilty of this. Anybody ever looked at somebody else with lustful thought in your mind? Right? Jesus says, if you've even looked with somebody with lust, you've already committed adultery. Oh, wait, it gets worse. How many of you out here have ever hated somebody? You've been so angry. There you go, somebody. I hate that person. I know I have. You know what Jesus says? He says, if you have, if you have hated somebody and you've already committed murder in your heart, you don't have to go get a knife or a gun to murder somebody. You can murder somebody with your heart. How many have ever taken God's name in vain, right? Why? Because that is the God, the real God that exists. Do you ever know nobody cusses in the name of Santa Claus? 
right? Nobody cusses and, 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 and says, oh, Santa Claus, or oh, Leprechaun, or oh, Easter Bunny, or the other false gods that are out there, oh, Allah, or oh, Buddha. Why? Because they don't exist. But the one God that does exist, our sinful hearts blaspheme him when we get mad, and we use God's name as a four-letter curse word. Listen, I'm not even through all the Ten Commandments, and already, by your own admission, we, have, we are lying, thieving, blaspheming, murdering adulterers at heart. And we're only halfway through the Ten Commandments. You see how bad this is for us right now? That's how God sees us. Yes. Well, no, the, the two greatest, the greatest command was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second greatest command was love your neighbor as yourself. And as he pointed out, actually, do you know those two commandments sum up the whole ten? Because the first commandment, the love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, is a summary of the first four. The second one, love your neighbor as yourself, is five through ten. But anyway, we're given that to show that we can't, we, we can't earn our way. And so, so we need... We need Christ's righteousness. We need a Savior. We need someone to pay that debt for us. And if that was you in that courtroom, and right before the judge is ready to sentence you, it's as if somebody steps through the courtroom, steps in front of you and says, I'll take the punishment. I'll pay the debt. That's what Jesus did on the cross. You see, friends, on the cross, the Bible says, He who knew no sin became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. Now what that means is not that we become righteous. There's no Christians that are righteous anywhere. Okay? We don't become righteous, but we're seen as righteous because of the work of Christ on the cross. When God looked down on His Son, the reason why our sins are paid for is because God poured out His wrath on Jesus. That's why Jesus says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To be forsaken means to cut off, means to be separated. Okay? And Jesus was separated from the Father because He looked down on Christ and he saw Christ the way he sees you and me. He saw on Jesus Christ, when he looked down on Christ, he saw your sin on, on his son. And he treated that the way we should be treated, which is pouring out his wrath on that sin. Completely and fully. Now, does anybody out here want to make the claim that they could withstand that wrath? Absolutely not. Not one of us. That's why I said we need a Savior. Because the way God sees you without Jesus Christ is a very, very ugly, vile thing. You see, the way God sees you, the way God, you know how God sees you if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you want to know how God sees you? Do you want to know how God sees you without Jesus Christ? Can I tell you? Can I tell you? If I could take a DVD of all your thoughts and all your actions, Listen, I know this gets bad. Every single thing you've ever thought, everything you've ever done, okay, and I could put it on a DVD, and I had a big screen over here, a big jumbotron up here on this building, and I was going to go push play. You would do everything you could to stop me because you don't want everybody in Clarksburg knowing, right, what you have even thought in your mind. And if you couldn't stop me and I did push play, you would run out of here not to be seen again because you'd be so embarrassed of your sin, as would I. As would I. And that is how, friends, God sees you if you do not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's how God sees you. Now, let's go back to the cross where the Bible says, For he who knew no sin became sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. Now you understand, when God looked down, He saw Christ as He sees you and me without Christ, just like I described to you. He saw that wickedness of our sin. He saw that lusting in our eyes. He saw the pride in our heart. And He treated His Son the way a father treats his son when he hates sin. He poured all out on His Son because God hates sin. He, he poured that out on Him. But that we practice righteousness. Now, we practice righteousness. We're not, we don't become righteous, but we practice that righteousness. We practice righteousness so that we try to live like our Savior. That we know 
We know that we aren't as we should be, but we thank God that He has made a way that we can, we can be uh, seen as righteous through His Son. And then the fourth test I want you to think about is if you call yourself a Christian, do you have a love for other Christians? Do you have a love for other Christians? John says in 1 John 3, 14, we know that we have passed from death into life because we love the brethren. That if you're born again, remember the key word tonight, are you born again? Are you born again? To be born again, you would love. You would love fellow man. You would love fellow Christians. To be born again, that you would weep over them when there's sadness. You would pray over them when there's sickness and a need. And you would serve them and come alongside them. And there would be a love for other Christians. Are you born again? That's, a, that's the fourth mark of being born again, is the love for the brethren. It, it's a very different love than this world. Listen, the word love gets tossed around here all the time. We see people in these relationships every other minute. Oh, I love you. Oh, I love you. I'm thinking of you. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll be there for you. And usually those people aren't there. This is a love, a special love, marked by a changed heart, marked by somebody who's been born again. This love for a Christian. And then the fifth, the fifth test I want you to think about, the fifth mark of a Christian, the fifth mark of somebody that has been born again. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 5, 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Overcomes the world. What that means is you have a new heart. You have a love for the God that died for you. You have a love for the God that saved you. You have a love for the God that made a way for eternity for you not to die in eternal death that you and I deserve in hell. That you have a love so much for that God and the God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you have overcome the world. That you don't care what this world, you don't care what your friends think. You don't care what he thinks or she thinks or what the mission thinks or this thinks and that thinks. You you care about Christ and Christ alone. You care about serving and loving God of who He is and what He said He's done. That, that, that you seek God's praise more than man's praise. You seek God's praise more than man's praise because you've been born again. That new heart loves the things that God loves and hates the things that God hates. That you have a new relationship. Not just with Jesus, but you have a new relationship with sin. A relationship and when you hate sin, that you don't want to be around sin, that you want to be uh, 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 in right standing and please God with your actions, that you have overcome the world that, that you don't want. And the last, the sixth mark that I want to give you of somebody that has been born again, the last one is, is, is from 1 John 5.18. He says, He that is begotten of God keepeth himself. That, that you are careful, that you are keeping yourself pure. Now, as I said before, sadly, Christians do sin. Sadly, yes, we do. And we need God's grace and mercy every day. Every breath you take, friend, you're sucking in mercy with every breath you take. If you are not born again, every breath you take is another chance at eternal life that God is giving you. And what are you doing with it? Everything. So there's this, there's this keeping oneself pure. That when you're born again, you know the things that cause you into temptation into sin. That if you're born again, you care more about God than your flesh. You care more about pleasing God than pleasing your body. That if you've been delivered or you're struggling and you know that you, you are succumbing to the sin of alcoholism, you don't go around the bar. If you know that drugs are an issue for you, you stay away from those temptations. If you know that adults and, 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 and those kind of relationships are bad. You stay away from those situations. If, if you're stuck in a, in a sin of, of stealing, you stay away from that stuff. It's a matter of keeping yourself pure. Not that you can do it on your own, but that you have a new heart, that you've been born again. And that you're born again. That new heart will have those kind of desires. That, that, that you know that evil communications to the heart are, are more readily received. How many of you guys know that it's easier to get sick than to stay healthy, right? It's easier to get sick than to stay healthy. We can stand out here for, for, for a little while in the rain and the shade and the cold, and we'll get sick real easy. But we can't get, stay healthy that way. And it's the same way with the sin in your life. It's easier to fall into sin than to stay pure and keep yourself. But if you have a new heart because you've been, yes, born again, if you've been born again, 
That new heart will desire those things. That new heart will steer clear of things that cause corruption. Will steer clear of things that cause sin. And the minute you stumble and trip and fall into that sin, you will run back to the God that saved you. You will run back for forgiveness. You will run back for peace. You will run back for mercy. You will run back for joy. You will run back for hope that only can be found in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And these are marks of someone that has been born again, a, a new creature in Christ. You've been born again. So friends, these are, these are things, these are marks of it. And, and here's the best part. Here's the best part. Not only did God go and slaughter His Son for you and I, that we may have eternal life, but here's the best part. On that tree, on that cross, Jesus said the three most incredible words in all of history, in all of existence, to give all of us hope. Jesus says, He says, Tetelestai, which means it is finished. What is finished, friends? What is finished? Jesus says it is finished. What is finished is your sin debt. What is finished is your condemnation that you deserve in the wrath of hell. What is finished is all that you owe to God for your sin against Him. It is finished. It is finished. It is paid in full. Your sin has been paid for completely by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone by His death on the cross. It is finished. So that when you come to Christ and you bow a knee, Jesus says in Mark 1.15 that the kingdom of God is at hand. Now repent and believe in the gospel. That you believe in the gospel. Do you believe in the gospel, young man? You believe in the gospel. That Jesus is not some accessory to your life, but that you believe in the gospel to the point that your heart has been changed and you've been, guess what? Born again. That you've been born again. And when Christ died on that cross, He said, it is finished. And He gave up the ghost. And when He did, He goes to the tomb. They buried, they buried Jesus for three days. Three days he lay in that tomb. And on the third day he rose again, appearing before up around 500. Until 40 days later he ascended into heaven where he is today, seated at the right hand of the Father, where he is ruling and reigning. That's the Jesus that every one of you will stand before. If you die tonight, what's going to happen a second into eternity? The Bible says it's appointed a man to die once, then comes the judgment. And friends, you will hear either one of two things. Understand, you're not going to get right with God after you die. Now is the time. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Friends, that you would not put it off. That you would not, that you would not say, I'll oh, get right with God sometime. That you would know tonight that if you stand before God, it's either going to be the greatest thing you could ever hear or the worst thing you could ever hear. The greatest thing you could ever hear is, well done, my good and faithful servant, as God welcomes you into heaven. The worst thing that you can possibly hear is the worst thing that any of us can hear, and it's, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Those are the worst words that you could possibly hear. We don't want that for you, friends. That's why we're here sharing the good news of the gospel message, that you could hear this life-changing message, that you could come to know the Jesus of the Bible, not the Jesus of the Mormon faith, not the Jesus of the Jehovah Witness faith, not these other false religions, such as Islam and Buddhism and all these other fake religions. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus eliminated every other religious system out there. And that's our plea with you tonight, that you would turn to Christ, that you would be born again. I just gave you six marks to be born again. If you'd like a gospel track with those six marks or other things, if you want a Bible, come over here. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to pray with you. But put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone and call out to Christ, God, save me a sinner. Have mercy on me a sinner sinner. And God will not turn away someone that comes to Him with a right heart. God knows if you're playing games. God knows if you're just looking for a get out of hell free card. God knows if you're truly coming to Him with a broken spirit to be born again. So tonight, turn to Christ and live. Turn to Christ and be born again. God bless you guys and thank you for listening. Big problem, you know? Yeah. How you doing, brother? You want one of those? Did you get one of those? Here you go, sweetheart. Thank you. God bless you guys. Have a good night. Hello. This is Halo. It's from that message I just preached. If you guys have any questions, just give us a shout. Give us, we're here every Monday. Over there? Jason. That's me. Uh-oh. Am I in trouble? You know Beverly? Beverly.
what's her last name? Pulkington or something like that. Oh, yeah, but it's Mike's wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sponsored. Oh, yeah? I told her I was sitting out here. She's awesome. like, you need to talk yeah. to Jason. Hey, He's a yeah. good guy. Hey, Hannah, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, how's things with Henley? Got my own place. Did you? Yeah. Oh, give me a fist bump. I need to see you right there. Awesome. Hey, did you get one of these? That's a message I just preached, man. Give it a read when you get time. Yep. Everything's going good for me right now. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. We're yep. continuing Thank to pray you. for you Thank every day. You. If, you need, you. if you need anything, like I said, every Wednesday we're, or every Sunday, oh, every Monday we're over here. Really? And like I said, yeah, every Monday we're over here. And, um, around this time? Uh, yep, around this okay. time, about six to eight roughly. And then as long as it doesn't rain, we, we're glad we got out here tonight before we started. <laughs>